All right. Hello, everyone. This is Peter Miller. I am a psychologist in Alberta, in Canada. Uh, I have recently requested to uh, meet with uh, Guy McPherson um, as an opportunity um, to re-explore uh, some of the ideas uh, that I had explored with him in the past, um, an opportunity to actually provide, I think, a much better experience and um, hopefully a much better technical experience. I had a lot of troubles in that uh, area about five years ago. I first met Guy in, uh, or I first knocked on his virtual door in uh, 2018, and uh, after which he uh, uh, welcomed me for an interview to explore the, the territory. Um, so I've been practicing psychology um, as officially as a therapist for the last 12 years. I've been studying psychology for about 18 years. I have, I think for my whole life, whether I knew it or not, been interested in environmental issues and sort of the, the non-mainstream uh, uh, point of view. Uh, I have a deep rebellious side inside of me. Um, I first read one of Guy's book books, several books he has. I read one of his books in 2017, 2018. It was called Going Dark. And that's what led to me uh, sending him an email and just asking some questions. Um, so, yeah, I guess, Guy, like I, one of the things I was thinking of today, actually, uh, it's kind of funny, but like when I was in undergraduate school, I was doing a major in psychology and I was doing an undergraduate in sociology. And uh, the professors that really like rung my bell really kind of like fascinated me the most, even though I was majoring in psychology, I really liked the sociology professors. Um, and I think... I think the way you are and the way you present your material and kind of your aims and your motives, they remind me a lot of the sociology professors because they were uh, they were so good at kind of exposing the underbelly. Like they would they would kind of bring out the stuff that people don't talk about very much or they don't want to talk about at parties or whatever. Right? Like, uh, I was uh, I don't know why, but I, I'd sit in the front row. I'd have my hand raised all the time. Uh, and I just loved listening to these guys talk. And um, I think what really gravitated uh, me wanting to talk to, to you was like, I wanted to talk to someone like a sociology professor, but who was in the area of climate science and ecology. And um, so I could, um, and maybe, you know, of course, speak with someone who likes to go in the territory that others just will not, or they cannot for their own reasons, right? Um, so when I first talked to you in 2018, I had a few clusters of areas that I wanted to like explore. One was the, um, the mental health experience, uh, of, um, talking about this subject. I also wanted to kind of suss you out a bit as an individual and see like, you know, is this a legitimate dude? Um, I also wanted to like find out, is this near term human extinction stuff like really for real? Um, Another area was like, um, if it is real, like, is there anything we can do about it? Um, yeah, yeah, and beyond that, I think I was just wanting to find out, uh, you know, why do humans do this to themselves? I <laughs> kind of explore some of that stuff, right? And, I mean, so I, I mean, since 2018, you've had probably numerous experiences. And I have as well. Um, I'm a creative person. I, I develop projects, but then uh, because of my mental health challenges, I tend to blow them up. <laughs> I Just so everyone knows, and I'm not ashamed about it, I do suffer from borderline personality disorder. Um, it's been an issue in my life for, uh, well, probably my whole life, but I didn't really know and completely until about age 37, after which I started looking deeply into it and trying to figure out what to do and how to help myself. Um, and I developed uh, a blog, and I developed a book, uh, and a, a podcast. Um, and recently, I also have a course that I'm now giving away for free. Uh, it's called uh, the Free BPD Course. Um, 
But even if you don't have borderline, it actually is very helpful for anyone in uh, exploring any kind of mental health struggle because it covers cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavior therapy. And it is just chock full with uh, information and basically a, bar a biography of my life. If you want to learn more about what I've been through and what I've tried to do to, to deal with it, you can find and it at free, free bpdcourse.com. Oh, okay. And I was going to say, you can send me a link to it and we'll put it in the description and, yeah. and immediately beneath this video. Yeah. So people will be able to click on it and find it easily. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, happy to give it away for free. And there's also a donation link if you're if you have a few bucks to spare. A lot of hard work did go into it. So, so where should we begin, guy? I mean, uh, I think uh, when I first uh, started asking you some questions, I went into uh, uh, Michael Rupert. I was well, that was one of my first questions and how you knew him, and and what you know and think about his his life and the end of his life and. So maybe we should start there. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Today? Well, so people bear in mind that this is about five years ago. We had these conversations. We had 16 recorded conversations, each uh, approximately an hour long. And this time we're going to post them on the Nature Bats Last channel. So if you're watching, you're familiar with Nature Bats Last probably, and you've been following my work for a while. We're going to explore some of that information that we talked about five years ago, and presumably we're going to go off in different different directions as well. And thank you, Peter, for your service in offering a free course on bipolar disorder. Borderline so, personality disorder. <laughs> border, sorry. <laughs> Borderline personality disorder. Yeah. Mm, yeah. There's, there's a lot I don't know <laughs> on full display. So... Let's start with Michael C. Rupert, yeah. who interviewed me, I think, five times in the last 14 months that he had his radio show. And it was called the Lifeboat Hour. We never met. We talked on for his radio show repeatedly and a few other times as well. He called me the day before he committed suicide. And it obviously it didn't occur to me at the time that he was calling to say goodbye. Interestingly, that happened with another person more recently, within the last six months, somebody who I hadn't been in touch with for a very long time. He was in the class of David H. Smith postdoctoral fellows. And I was the inaugural director of that program back in 1999 to 2000. So just for about a one year period. And so this person contacted me out of the blue, wanted to have a conversation. No worries. So we talked for a long time and he didn't let on at the time that he was about to die. And I won't mention his name because he's not a public figure. Mm -hmm. Michael C. Rupert was a public figure and as with almost everybody who committed suicide that I knew or that I know I was accused of being the the person who caused his suicide as if I have that sort of power over somebody like Rupert and also as if I would want to each time this has happened I was accused of causing the suicide of a friend I don't have enough friends the way it is why would I want them to die? This doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Michael C. Rupert published an expansive book, the, the first book that went into great detail on the events of 9-11 as an inside job. And he, he started right out by saying this is circumstantial evidence. You know, he wasn't there. He doesn't have peer-reviewed papers to offer and so on. But it was an amazing book that I think came out less than a year after September 11th, 2001. So he was an incredible scholar who had an op who had the ability to put, put, put together very relatively disparate information and organize and synthesize it in a way 
that made sense to most people, that most people could actually understand, which is not often the case with complex information, as I'm sure you're aware, Peter. Mm -hmm. So that's... He was really sharp, really sharp. And uh, in some of those interviews and uh, mini documentaries, I guess, about his look at things you can find on YouTube, he's just so sharp and so right. um, well-informed. Right. Well, he had been a police officer in Southern California, and he was a whistleblower as a police officer with respect to the CIA and running drugs and money throughout the world. Interesting fellow and incredibly sharp, as you say. So it was a joy to interact with him in the relatively few times I was able to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've explored the... Um the mental health sort of um, possibilities, I guess, when it comes to diving into this kind of territory. Like, and like you said, it is, it can never be so simple as to be attributed to uh, one speaker, one person's point of view, one author. Um, so, I mean, it really would be utterly ridiculous to just place all the, the blame on, on you, for example. Uh, people come with a, a complete history, uh, a complete brain development. They're in a the context of their own lives. Uh, and they could have lots of challenges that, that predate um, anything to do with this topic. Um, so they could be headed in that direction sort of like regardless. Um, I guess one of my concerns was that uh, people could maybe uh, get a little bit more extra pessimistic if they were looking at this information in the wrong sort of way. Um, so it's important to kind of like clarify what to do with it i think like once you start learning about it um it is like it's fascinating and no wonder people are drawn to it um but uh, there probably are sort of psychological side effects if you know what i mean you know i've been using this example for many years this is to, to me this is a lot like the medical community through the 1960s up until the early 1970s it was considered perfectly legitimate and reasonable for doctors to with for medical doctors to withhold information about their dying patients. So if I, as a medical doctor can tell based on the symptoms, based on the lab results that you, for example, have six months or less to live, then they wouldn't even tell. Sometimes they would tell the family, but sometimes they wouldn't tell anybody at all. And then starting in the early 1970s, it became, commonplace for medical doctors to start telling individuals when they had a terminal condition. That's the analogy to what I've been doing since June 20th, 2012, when on my blog, I first announced that we were in the midst of abrupt irreversible climate change. Interestingly, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, reached the same conclusion with two reports, uh, October 8th, 2018, global warming of 1.5 degrees. And on September 24th, 2019, the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere and a changing climate. So in these two separate reports, they concluded that climate change was abrupt and irreversible respectively. Abrupt, how abrupt? Here's one of the lines from the report global warming of 1.5 degrees. Even abrupt geophysical events do not approach current rates of human-driven change. Well, that's pretty amazing. This included, by the way, the interstellar body that struck the planet about 66 million years ago and led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. What's happening now is more abrupt than that. That's astonishing. And as ecologists know, but apparently relatively few other people, it's the rate of environmental change that determines the success of every population and every species. So considering that we're in the midst of an, an abrupt climatic event, more abrupt even than 66 million years ago, which drove the dinosaurs to extinction, that, that tells me that we're in serious trouble. And then Finally, the IPCC reached the conclusion that climate change was irreversible, in this case due to an overheated ocean, with their IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere and a change in climate. 
And so you would think, since this all happened oh, three or four years ago, that the IPCC catching up, that people would start to come around to my way of thinking. But so far, I haven't seen much of that happening. Mm -hmm. The exceptions are probably the people who are watching this who follow regular the, the Nature Bats Last YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I was recently um, reading a book that you might find interesting too. I'm just going to quickly look up the author here. But, um, <laughs> and it kind of like kind of leads into my next line of inquiry here. But the book is called um, The Bullshit Machine. <laughs> by uh, <laughs> It's by Putrid... Schickenstein. <laughs> Schickenstein. <laughs> it's called the, the, the bullshit machine. <laughs> that, that's got to be a pen name for yeah, the, yeah, it. Undoubtedly written by the U.S. government. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's loaded with kind of like quotes about um, diff, sort of the different types of people. Some people are sort of, I think, willing and want to kind of look at the underbelly and they want to like find out some of the, the facts that most people ignore. And then there's other people who are just sort of... Uh, he calls them believers and non-believers, I think. Uh, they sort of believe in the system and, you know, that it has our best interests in mind and, uh, you know, that it, uh, it's not run by sociopaths or sociopathic types. Um, but he was, he's very point blank in some of the, the wording, and I, I just sort of love it, adore it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've, I've uh, been posting some of those quotes and finding it just so oh so juicy. <laughs> <laughs> but it kind of reminds me of some of the wording and verb verbiage that you use too. Like you're not uh, you're not uh, scared at all to kind of say just exactly what it is. Call a spade a spade, and that's another thing that makes you kind of stand out. Is like you you don't hold back, uh, and you don't uh, kind of like candy candy coat things. And um, I guess my my next line of inquiry was: so were you sort of playing the game for a while in your life, and then? just suddenly switched kind of like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to play this fakery phony game, like in, absolutely. In, your, in the university of Arizona there. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, let's see. Started my blog in, I think late July or early August, 2007. And I started it because I delivered a presentation, the graduation ceremony for the Master of Public Health program at the University of Arizona. And for some reason, still unclear to me, I talked about the taboo of our species going extinct and a lot of other factors as well about collapse of the entire system we've all grown up within. And interestingly, my new school director, what most people will consider department head, was in the audience in the front row. And I told all kinds of jokes. I thought it was funny as could be. She didn't crack a smile once. So mm -hmm. she didn't think it was so funny, the things I was talking about. And so I started my blog specifically because a copy of that presentation was going around and coming back to me. And there were errors in those copies. And so I wanted to fix them. So I took the, the original script plus some things I left out. And that became the first substantive blog post. And it's been all downhill from there. But, <laughs> but that was in 2007. I didn't leave active service at the university until 2009, May 1st, 2009. And I left May 1st and I started May 1st because... That's the that's the day we celebrate workers around the world, mm -hmm. with the exception of the United States, of course. Uh, our Labor Day is always in early September instead of the first of May. But I wanted to make a point with my arrival, and which was pretty accidental, actually, and certainly with my departure that I left on May first, twenty years to the day after I started, and so you know with. As with many of the things that I've done, I had I had a point. And the point was to draw attention to something that's important. And in this case, celebrating the workers of the world. And um, 
So was there like a tipping point or a breaking point in your thinking where you were saying, I need to talk about this information because people won't talk about it in the right way or they won't, they keep um, maybe um, uh, making it, being too conservative about it, conservative about it or uh, oh, yeah. trivial, trivializing it? I edited a book along with a colleague of mine in, was that 2002, I think. I think the book was published in 2003. Let me just grab a copy to make sure. Changing Precipitation Regimes and Terrestrial Ecosystems, A North American Perspective. And it came out in 2003. And as we were editing this book, it became clear to me that we were close to being screwed, if not already screwed, with respect to climate change, that we had poured so many greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that the only way out that I could imagine would be to terminate industrial civilization. This was well before I discovered the best kept secret in climate science, the aerosol masking effect, or I would not have left active service on campus. But in working on this book in 2002, it occurred to me that we're in real trouble. And it seemed like the obvious thing to do would be to take action. Because I was a relatively well-known professor, I thought people would follow my lead and we'd make progress towards fixing this very significant problem. That was before I discovered it was a predicament with the aerosol masking effect. And also much later, much after I left active service, peer-reviewed papers indicated that the meltdown of nuclear power plants would cause the stripping away of stratospheric ozone, which would lead to very, very rapid heating of the planet. Interesting with this, this is demonstrated very subtly in the 2021 film Finch, Finch like a bird starring Tom Hanks. And they took a little artistic license. Every time somebody's hand or arm went out into the sunlight, it would burn immediately. You could see the sunburn happening in a matter of seconds. Actually, it would probably take a matter of minutes when we have the stratospheric ozone stripped away, but let's just call that artistic license. In any event, the writers of this 2021 film knew what happens when we have nuclear power plants melt down and the consequences that follow. So I didn't know about that, obviously. I didn't know about aerosol masking, or I would not have left active service. I would still be making reasonable money doing the work I th that I love instead of talking with you. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Understandable. I, you guys, you know, you do pretty good, right? When you're, when, when you're uh, what do you call that again? Um, where they can't fire you. <laughs> right. I had tenure, in fact. Tenure, tenure, yeah. I had I what less than one in two hundred people who get a PhD in the natural sciences go on to be a full professor, mm -hmm. and I I did so before I turned forty, which is stunningly rare. And mm -hmm. so you know I thought people would pay attention and follow my lead when I left the workplace, mm -hmm. and fortunately they didn't, or we'd all be dead by now. Because it doesn't take everybody walking away from their workplace. It, it just takes uh, probably 20 or 30 percent to cause loss of aerosol masking due to a reduction in industrial activity. Mm -hmm. So it's a good thing people kept working. And people point out to me very frequently how, how horrible the millionaires and the billionaires are by pouring all those greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And I point out that those people are responsible for maintaining aerosol masking and the rest of us are responsible for conserving natural resources. Mm -hmm. So it's a delicate balance, but <laughs> they're the, they're the good guy, bad guys. They're right, good. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and I mean, there's nothing we can do about it anyway. So let's just recognize that those people are actually doing something useful, whether they intend to or not. And, I mean, it's not like you and me screaming from the rooftops is going to cause any billionaire to stop flying planes, right? 
So let's just go with the flow. Yeah. And so your aim then, like when you wanted to make these big changes and, and talk to the public about it, it was to uh, just to be tr truthful or, and to try and you wanted to try and create change if possible. Right. Um, yeah. Well, and, I wanted to create change in individuals' lives. I want people to know what's going on. I mean, that's, that's my whole life as an educator. That's what I've been trying to do is informing people about what's going on in the world around them so they can participate at what le whatever level they find suitable. And for most people, that means getting a job because most of us have to have a job. So, right. So we can make the money so we can participate in society at all, mm -hmm. including going to rock concerts and whatever. Right. So, and so I'm not here to be judgmental. I just want people to have the information that I have so that they can make an informed decision about what to do with their lives. You know, and for me, that means turning to the ancients and spending a lot of time reading. You mentioned your book. Mm -hmm. and not a book anymore. It's just a course now. <laughs> okay. okay. Your course. I just, put it, I just put it all together. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> And so I'm reading two books by Sarah Bakewell. Um, first one is, I think it's called At the Existential Cafe. I finished that one. And what's the other one? A Life of Montaigne. And, and actually, Bakewell uses the longest titles I've ever seen in my life. So the subtitle for the first book takes up the entire front page, the entire front cover. So, and, and sure enough, she includes an enormous amount of information on things that are important to me, you know, so she's quoting the ancients and she's quoting more recent philosophers as well and fascinating stuff. I started reading them at the request of the founder of Hubris, which used to be called Weekly Hubris and more recently has changed his name to Hubris, and the founder and editor of and producer of that series of articles um, to which I've been contributing for quite a few years now, ask everybody to read these. And turns out right up my alley. It's the kind of stuff I was reading voraciously in the early 2000s. And so mm -hmm. it's been pleasant to return to that information. So yeah, Sorry. like you're saying, like enjoy the the things that you enjoy the most uh, at this stage. Um, so like, yeah, if you like uh, uh, making music, make music. If you like exploring the ter the uh, intellectual territory, go there. Uh, whatever kind of like uh, inspires you the most. And so you know, I like to be controversial a bit, right? <laughs> um, and I like to use certain kinds of wordings too. Um, but like when you were kind of separating yourself from the mainstream, there, I mean. So, I mean, and and from lots of the interviews that I've, or inter, uh, videos that you've put out, and I guess interviews too, that you've put out like in the last five years, like it seems like there's there's different types of professionals or different types of intellectuals. Like some some are willing to kind of say what it is and some are not. And uh, I think there's like a different type of personality or individual. And I I'm hesitant to use this term, but I think it might apply. Like, so if people are willingly holding back if they're willingly deceiving or lying like uh it, the, this the word sociopathic seems appropriate to me um because it's kind of like they're saying like i would rather make sure that i have like the money that i need to create the life that i want instead of being honest to the public about what is actually going on um so there seems to be like and, and most people they can't cross over to where you are they can't just they just can't do it um or they don't want to do it, or they come up with reasons to, to to think it's a bad idea, or start labeling and denigrating you as this, like whatever um, crazy person. I don't know. There's so many labels, right? But, right, right, and they've all been applied to me. Trust me. <laughs> but yeah, like, what's, think... what what separates you from them? Like, why are you willing to do it and they are not? Like, I I know that there's probably one exact right. reason, but well, I I think it's pretty clear. I have nothing left to lose. Those people have a lot of privilege to lose. I left active service at the university. You know, I'm still professor emeritus. I can do everything I was doing before, everything. I can teach, I can 
advise graduate students. I can advise undergraduate students. I can do research, all that. I can do all that except get paid. So but why why great. are you willing to go the honest route? I would call it the honest route, uh, where you are willing to talk about all of the underbelly and the others are not. Uh, because I have nothing left to lose. They have mm -hmm. an enormous amount of privilege to lose. But you had privilege, right? And then you gave yes. it up. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I did. I gave it up. And it's the only way that I could do the work I'm doing now. You know, I have the respect of a few people. I have the love of a wonderful woman. That's about it. I've been ghosted, to use a contemporary term, by essentially all of society, including my family members. Mm -hmm. My dad died thinking horrible things about me because of this coordinated defamation campaign that, that first destroyed my public life, my ability to deliver presentations. You know, somebody asked me to deliver a presentation. They send me an email message. I write back right away and say, yeah, sure. Let's talk about details, where, when, blah, blah, blah. And then by the before they have an opportunity to respond, they've received an email message from one of half a dozen figures involved in the defamation campaign uh, pointing out that I'm a horrible person. So they better not host me. Could be bad for their health. And so what, oh, wait, do you think, oh, what, do you think there goes the invitation? Do you think what they're doing is immoral or unethical? What would you call it? Absolutely. I would call it worse things than that, but we're on the air here. <laughs> no, these, these are people who have concluded based on zero evidence whatsoever that I'm a liar and a sexual predator. Mm -hmm. And if I were a sexual predator, by the way, this, this thing has been going on for nearly six years. Don't you think I would have been charged with something? Yeah. Don't you think yeah. maybe I would be serving time now? Yeah, that would be. But no, already, there's, yeah. there's never been any charges brought up against me. Go figure. That's because I haven't done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, there were two attorneys who offered to work pro bono on my behalf. One was a renowned attorney, Gerald Maples, who sued more than 100 fossil fuel companies in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. And, and I only mention his name because he was a public figure. He slipped on a dock in the Bahamas and died December 4th, 2020. Almost two years later, I finally had another renowned legal team, not as well known as him, although the, the lead attorney in that case had made it as far as being a, a judge in the state he was working in. And within eight days of me receiving a me an email message from them indicating that this was going to be an easy case. The defamation is clear. First, we'll go after the people who made the money, like David Wallace Wells. Shouldn't be a difficult case at all. Eight days later, they had been terrified into running away. They received email messages mm -hmm. um, of cartoon figures with blood-soaked hands. And they just they couldn't do it. And I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. It's it's dangerous to work on my behalf. Sounds like it becomes life-threatening. Absolutely. Yes, right. If uh, they're going to try and clear your name kind of thing. Right. And so I can't even ask anybody at this point. I can't ask for legal advice from anybody because why would I do that to somebody? Mm -hmm. Hmm. And the evidence, I mean, the evidence that you present and the ways that you have connected the information and, um, just so everyone knows, I had watched uh, uh, several of Guy's uh, videos where he's in classrooms. He used to do that presentation, right? And um, um, I, I fully grasp it now. It took me a while to fully grasp the global dimming aspect, but I get it now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, that that being the case, like, it's hard to... Uh, it's just hard to understand why they don't accept the evidence that you present and um, well, how they can how and, they can deal with the cognitive dissonance. Uh, right. And I should point out baffling. I should point out that unlike when I was on campus and I was collecting primary data, I was going out with students and collecting data in the field or in the laboratory. That's primary and then publishing the results in peer reviewed papers. Now, what I'm doing now, and since I left active service, what, almost 15 years ago, something like that, 14 plus years ago, um, it's all secondary data. 
because I don't have the money or the time to go out and collect information, primary information. So I rely upon, rely upon the work of other people like the IPCC and peer reviewed papers to reach the conclusions that I'm reaching now. So in a way I'm acting like most economists do. And you know what they call economics, right? The dismal science. So maybe I'm conducting a dismal version of science now, but that's what I'm left doing yeah, because I don't have access to the kind of research money I had before, much less the infrastructure, the students and the laboratories and so on. But the evidence is still forthcoming. You offer it up. Yes. And it's I, like um, and people I, just sort I of don't take it seriously or something. I didn't create any of this evidence, right? Because I've been away from campus for so long. I don't have access to research funds. So I'm depending upon the, the work of other scholars to reach my conclusions. So if you take issue with me, as the Washington Post did recently, then you're not really taking issue with me. You're taking issue with the peer-reviewed papers I'm presenting mm -hmm. that I've just collated and organized and synthesized and put out for other people, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not really me you're taking issue with, Shannon Osaka of the Washington Post. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so as far as like the 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 factors that you how you put it together and collated it and that you used to present in the classrooms um so nothing is really different now than it was five years ago right i mean that all that stuff still holds the way you used to present it Yes, although it has become more clear, like I said, the IPCC within the last five years has concluded that climate change is abrupt, more abrupt than any other event in planetary history, and also irreversible. So there's a lot more support for evidentiary support for the statements I've been making for a long time than there was five years ago. You know, and the information continues to accumulate, as you would expect. And it's all pointed in the wrong direction, of course, because that's what we do. We, mm -hmm. we generate greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and we also have a pandemic that came along since we last had this series of conversations. And that pandemic demonstrated the aerosol masking effect quite clearly on a regional basis, starting in the area over Wuhan, China, where industrial activity was reduced. And what happened was it got much warmer and there was considerably more precipitation than there had been before. And then it moved to various places in Europe and then in the Northeastern United States as industry was declining, not being completely obliterated, but just declining. And that caused warming of those specific regions mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and also more precipitation in those regions because a, a warmer planet is a wetter planet. Yeah. And that applies regionally as well. So we have more information, we have better data now than we did five years ago. And it all points to the aerosol masking effect being very strong and being capable of being reduced in a very short period of time. So- And the CO2 in the atmosphere continues to rise uh, as oh, yeah. indicated in Hawaii, right? And the, the Arctic melting is, isn't it at an all time high right now? Or? Yes, and so is Antarctica. Antarctica, Antarctica yeah. is what's called a five sigma event. It's it's essentially impossible what's going on right now in Antarctica. I'm a little surprised actually that, and very, very pleased that we still have Arctic ice floating on the Arctic Ocean because that's the single factor over which we have least control at this point. There's so much inertia driving the loss of Arctic ice that we have very little control over it. If we're going to maintain civilization, this set of living arrangements in any form, then the ice is ultimately going to go away. Now, interestingly, Jennifer McKinnon of the Scripps Institution, which is part of the Scripps Institute, and she's also at the University of California, San Diego, upon release of a paper of hers in Nature Communications, she predicted an ice-free Arctic in 2022. And then James Anderson, and obviously it didn't happen in 2022. James Anderson, the Harvard atmospheric scientist famous for discovering the link between chlorofluorocarbons and the Antarctic ozone hole, said, quote, the chance there will be permanent ice in the Arctic after 2022 is essentially zero, end quote. 
And that was in Forbes on January 15th, 2018. And it's not going to happen this year either. He predicted it for 2023. The U.S. Naval Postgraduate School puts out a six-month ensemble forecast, which is very, very um, useful and conservative, scientifically conservative. In fact, they've been showing their forecast six months in advance, and they also show the actual data points. And their forecast will be following a line like this. And then the data points lag behind. They're shown in red dots. And in every case so far, the red dot is higher than their than their forecast. So that indicates that they're being pretty conservative. And they indicate that we're not going to have an ice-free Arctic this year. In fact, the Arctic Ocean is going to have about 5 million square kilometers of ice floating on it at the at the lower point, which would be September 17th of this mm-hmm. year. So I think we can say with great certainty that we're going to not have an ice-free Arctic Ocean, unlike what professors McKinnon and Anderson said a few years ago. So that's really good news because the ice-free Arctic Ocean, as I indicated, would cause a rate of environmental change so rapid that I can't imagine very many species being able to keep up with it. Populations and species would go extinct much more rapidly than they already are here in the midst of a mass extinction event. Because of the methane primarily, right? Under the ocean? No, the, no. Everything I've talked about so far just re, just indicates albedo. So mm-hmm. we're talking about going from this color to a little bit lighter than this, yeah. something like, like this color. Mm-hmm. The dark blue, going from white to dark blue. They aren't even considering the almost certain release of methane that would occur when the Arctic Ocean becomes ice-free. So we're not even talking about that. In fact, just the change in albedo or reflectance would cause the equivalent of more than 25 years, more than the last 25 years of carbon dioxide emissions. More than more than 25, about 27, and a, the equivalent of 27 and a half years of carbon dioxide release, the last 27 and a half years, all within a matter of a few months. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> it would just uh, bump, come up from the ocean because of the loss of albedo. Yes. Okay. Yes. And you know, we an, an El Nino has begun an El Nino Southern Oscillation on the back of a triple dip La Nina. La Nina is the cooling phase when greenhouse gases and heat are sucked into the ocean. And we've been in a triple dip El La Nina, which hasn't been observed since records have been kept about for 75 years. And we're headed now into an El Nino Southern Oscillation, which will cause release of those greenhouse gases and heat from the ocean where it's Mm -hmm. been stored for all this time. And so that alone could be enough to trigger an increased rate of the loss of ice floating in the Arctic Ocean. Also, that alone might be enough to trigger such a rapid heating of the planet that organisms have a very difficult time keeping up. So it's all bad news, you know, like it usually is for me. (laughs) You're the number one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, the number one at saying it like it is, I think, is what I mean to say. And um, to actually point out, and like most people won't, they when when you want it, when you try and hold a system or a society accountable, it's almost like it's almost like they triangulate against you or something. They're kind of like, no, we're not that bad. It's not that bad. But I think, like, ever since Industrial Revolution, like, it's become, like, diabolical. That's what I would call it. Like, where you're you're trying to mass produce everything. Like, and the way you become, you know, the th- way of thinking about how to be, you know, the best kind of human is to, like, try and, uh, like, uh, rape and pillage the earth as best as you can and, 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 and make as much money as you can while you're doing that. And then you're, like, you know, then you're revered. Then you're an icon. Then you're right. a legend. You're a legend, right. like like Henry Ford or something, right? Like, right, exactly. One of the worst people to occupy the planet is a superhero in the minds of most people. <laughs> Henry Ford. 
<laughs> and he was right in the uh, Industrial Revolution, amongst many others, right? And um, Right, absolutely. So yeah. before we get too far away from the topic of bad news, I want to I want to list five things that we learned this past week. So here we are on Friday night. So these are the big news stories. According to Antonio Guterres, the United Nations Secretary General, global boiling is here. He changed the phrasing. It's not global boiling. I mean, it's not global warming now. It's global boiling. July is the hottest month on record with 24 hottest days in a row. That's more than a 100,000 year event, by the way. There's wildfires everywhere. Okay, so that's item one. Item two, the oceans are rapidly warming. Coral reefs died in Florida last week in less than a week after the significant warming occurred, heating up to, in the ocean, mind you, more than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It's, it's like taking a warm bath, right? Mm -hmm. Marine life is dying. Oceans produce more than 50% of our oxygen. If marine life collapses, so do we. Item three, Antarctica didn't recover its winter ice. The chances of that, this is a once in seven and a half million year event. One in seven and a half million year event. Antarctica didn't recover its winter ice. G20 nations failed to agree to cut fossil fuels. That's no surprise, of course, because fossil fuel companies have a lot to do with, have a lot of control, I would argue, a lot of influence over governments of the world. So the fossil fuel companies walked away from their pledges to continue making record profits. And item five, I heard this many times during this last week, scientists say, say we need to take dramatic and urgent action this year, right now, not 2030, which is what everybody's been saying, mm -hmm. not 2050, which is the common line through mm -hmm. the beginning of this year, mm -hmm. but right now. So other scientists are starting to figure out that this is a matter of serious concern. Are we going to do anything? It would surprise me. <laughs> uh, how many I mean, of because those, uh... of... Be in part because of the aerosol masking effect, it's difficult to know what to do, right? We, we can't just turn off the switch on fossil fuels or right. that'll, that'll fry us even faster. The only thing that I could conclude from our previous discussions and the only thing that made any sense to me for a potential solution was carbon sequestration at epic scales. Um, and there's, I'm guessing there hasn't been progress made in that regard or, um, and I was actually, I should also add this. I was, talking to people I know about this and it's, uh, you know, they're kind of like saying, who should take responsibility for this? Uh, and my thinking is the biggest emitters should take the responsibility. They created a, pro a product that uh, created a waste that landed in our atmosphere and uh, has an effect on all of us. And, uh, but the thing is, of course, they don't want to pay to clean up the waste, right? Of course. There's no money in cleaning up. There's money in making dirty, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and the fossil fuel companies have been legendary at making money and making waste. And essentially at this point, laying waste to the planet. And getting away with it because it's invisible, more or less, right? In part. And, you know, they had a campaign that paralleled the tobacco campaign right, of the 50s and 60s, we were, even when I was a kid in the early 1960s, through the, I think all the way through the 1960s, you'd see these commercials for cigarettes on television, not allowed anymore. And people would be smoking away and saying, this is good for you. You know, trying to convince people that what something that actually causes lung cancer and ruins your life in a thousand other ways is good for you. And they, they were saying it out loud. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have a, mm -hmm. a an advertising campaign for the last, well, going back at least to the 1970s that parallels that with the oil industries. Mm -hmm. You know, the fossil uh, fuel industries are legendary at their ability to convince people that if that this is what you need to make you happy. Right. Yeah. You need oil and gas and all the benefits that come with it. Uh, yeah, anything less is unacceptable. Um, I don't even think I started seeing those pictures on the cigarette packages until I was a, a teenager in the 90s. Uh, 
you know, like where they actually changed the packaging. Not that that had right. a huge effect. That maybe it had an effect for some of the upcoming smokers, but um, right for them you to know, actually say, you know, this is harmful. One of the best things my dad ever did for me was making me smoke a cigarette. You know, when I was like seven or I don't remember exactly how old I was, but but there were three of us, an older brother, a younger sister, and he made all of us smoke a cigarette. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was awful. We choked and puked and gagged. And it was the most horrible thing ever because he'd been a lifelong smoker, three packs a day. He knew it was it was horrible on so many levels. So he wanted us to never smoke again after that first experience. And I didn't until about 40 years later when I was on camera with Bill Nye and shooting an episode of National Geographic Explorer. And he said a line, I think comes from World War II, smoke them if you got them. And we smoked camel wides. And I thought it was great. I, I really felt bad for missing out on 40 or 45 years of, of smoking cigarettes because that felt <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> that's, that's funny. But, yeah. but then the habit, you know, old habits die hard. So do good habits, apparently. So I yeah. couldn't get on the cigarette bandwagon at that point. It was too late. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or you knew too much about it. Nothing, yeah. Well, you know, I think it's like like Michael C. Rupert, if we just kind of come full circle here and wrap up for today, are, are we at close to an hour here now? Sure. Yes, we are. Um, um, but just to kind of wrap up, like, uh, it, it, I, I don't think it's an, an easy place at all to um, kind of to be in this position or to be passionate about this kind of speaking, passionate about this kind of revealing about things. Um, I mean, some people like to listen to it, but I think the, the majority, they really kind of find it kind of off-putting or even kind of repulsive um, because it's like saying, no, you know, no, this system is, is diabolical. This system is sociopathic. And we are largely governed by people that, whether they are conscious of it or not, are those types of people. Um, and those are the ones who made this whole thing unsustainable from the start. That type of thinking where you try and mass produce, try and uh, leverage other people uh, and try and kind of hoard more for yourself and to make this kind of some kind of virtue. Right. So, you know, and I think people like you, like me, like and Michael C. Rupert were just like, fuck, no way. Like this is. That's 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 a horrible way to be human, um, and it's just like you can't. I can't stop kind of saying that, you know. Like, and uh, I tried to kind of bring awareness to the people around me, and I think they think it's, you're just it's just your borderline personality, Peter. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not it's not it's not it's not actually because you have an actual intellect. It's because you're you're a crazy man, <laughs> right? It's not the information you're presenting. It's that you're crazy. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I don't. I, I'm. I'm just assuming what people think. You know. I know that I can't read minds, and I do practice what I preach. I try to, although I fall apart from time to time. Who doesn't? Right. Um, um, we're human. Anyway, yeah. You know, we are. As but, Nietzsche wrote, we're all too human. We. But I mean, you've been characterized, defamed, and um, I, I think anyone who's going to be bold enough to talk about these things openly will likely experience the same. It just comes with the territory, right? Yes. So. While we're on the subject of Michael C. Rupert again, I want to point out, I'm not sure if it's still on YouTube, but there used to be a six-part series that he put together called yeah. Apocalypse Man, Apocalypse, mm -hmm. comma, Man. And if yeah. it's still on YouTube or somewhere out there, it is really worth watching. It's very mm -hmm. good stuff. It's among the last things he did before he died. Good stuff. Yeah, it was a great one. I think I watched that one too, for sure. And where, I, yeah, I just could so you see the, his sharpness. You know, it's it's in six short pieces, and so I, I can't stand to sit in front of a screen for very long. So I convinced myself that I was just going to watch one episode at a time. Then I come back tomorrow, I watch another one. I watched six in a row. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's really captivating. He's so well spoken. He's got he's just got data at his fingertips, or, or his rate, like right. He's, he's Absolutely, so, he's quick, and yep. and he's and he's correct. Uh, I think yes, um, yes. Uh, so. Um, and so I guess I'll just remind people at the end here, like um, about my course that I'm offering at freebpdcourse.com. Um, you know, even if we are in the midst of an extinction event, and even if these things are difficult to deal with emotionally, there's uh, uh, ways and means to work through it and to enjoy your life nonetheless. So I hope my course can help you in that way. I wanted that to be part of my discussions with Guy. Yes, thank you very much for bringing that up. And please, everybody take this seriously, because 
we don't have control over a lot of things in our lives, especially at the societal level with what's going on. But one thing we might have control over is our own, our own emotions, our own actions that we take. This is an opportunity for no charge to improve your own life and make your outlook more reasonable going ahead. So yeah. thank you for offering that course, Peter. Yeah, I'm glad to offer. All, All right. Nice. Thanks. And I'm going to shut this off now. Don't go away. Yeah. And everybody stay tuned for another episode as we continue the conversation.